HIT training sucks. It just doesn't work. You know why? Nobody does it right. Okay, so here's the thing. HIT training done properly is incredible for fat loss, especially in the short term. It's very fast acting, very effective, but almost nobody does it right. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to give away MAPS HIT to one of you lucky viewers. Now, this is HIT training done the right way. We programmed it properly. We made it so that the HIT training in this particular workout is effective. It's not just doing a bunch of exercises in succession to make you sweat. It's done the right way. Here's how you can win access to MAPS HIT. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment as the best comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to MAPS HIT. Now, everybody else, check this out. So in today's episode, we talk about HIT training, how everybody does it wrong, how to do it the right way. Some of you may want to just follow a program written out for you by fitness professionals and experts like us. So what we're doing right now is we're putting MAPS HIT on sale. It's actually 50% off. So if you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code December 50 for half off. By the way, that code also is going to work on MAPS split. So if you're more interested in just bodybuilding style workout programming, use that code, get half off MAPS split as well. All right, here comes the show. Boys, we are entering into a uh, HIT training season. I think this is when everybody starts, or it's close soon. Everybody starts to you, you let's know hit it. That's actually an, in an interesting point. Do you think that we are heading into the most popular time for hit, or uh, do you think it is heading into like springtime? No, well, I, I, think, I think so ooh, because yeah, after the holidays, it's like everybody gets in this hustle of like, oh no, like I, I need to do something about this, and what's the quickest way I can lose weight? Yeah, I remember specifically. So I started uh, training professionally, I guess as a, as a, I was a kid, right? So I was nineteen ninety seven or ninety eight. I started working in gyms and HIT didn't exist, right? The acronym high intensity interval training wasn't a thing. Yeah. Cardio was doing the stairmaster or the treadmill or the bike. In fact, ellipticals I don't even think existed at that time and that was that. And then I remember I don't remember when this happened. I want to say 102. Was it early 2000, it 2001? I, the reason why I remember so vividly is cuz I was a new trainer. I was pretty brand. I was like maybe a year or two into the business. And maybe like we could probably go back and like fact check me on these when it really started to, I mean, maybe it started before, but it was became popular Yeah, because mm -hmm. I was in the gyms. I was working in gyms in 2000 and it wasn't, but a year or two later did it become like, I mean, and, and being completely transparent, like I trained like every fucking client hit for like a year. Everybody did. <laughs> yeah, like didn't matter your goal. It didn't matter if you want to build muscle, lose body fat, all the, all the current studies that were being touted at that time were related to HIT and all its benefits. Well, I remember specifically there was one study that that is the reason why every trainer did this, especially yeah, new trainers. Yep. The experienced trainers didn't. I do remember that. It was all of us new trainers. But there was a study that came out that showed that something like you know, tw 15 minutes or 20 minutes of HIT training was as effective as, I don't remember, I mean to throw out a number, it was something like an hour worth of traditional steady state cardio. Uh -huh. So all of a sudden, everybody was like, oh my gosh, I could get the same potential calorie burning effect or fat loss effect or whatever with a, you know, less than half of the time. Mm -hmm. And so it just became this huge thing. And I, it was, it was probably early 2000s. I do remember that. And I remember all of a sudden nobody did traditional cardio. Everybody was doing uh hit training. I do gym. remember though, too, that study, the one I read at least was very controlled. It had a guy on a uh, bike and it, it wasn't an assault bike. But it was something very similar to that where they were doing just, constant sprints and then they would rest for a brief minute mm -hmm. they would do sprints again so it was like it was different than what all of a sudden hit became and, yeah. but, but that was definitely the study that then a lot of trainers used to justify these like mini so circuits. that's yeah. interesting that we're all i mean we all remember different studies so i remember the muscle sparing one yes so i remember the research yeah, that was done that. around how muscle sparing it was yeah. like oh and or you could do this cardio burn the most amount of fat but then not because here's the thing i remember being the the skinny kid trying to build muscle, I didn't want to lose muscle. So cardio was like just not happening. And so when this study came out and said, wow, I could do this cardio and actually not lose muscle, that it was the most muscle sparing way for you to do cardio. That's what triggered it for me, or at least what I remember. Now, Doug just pulled up 
a article that said this was popular in the 70s. I'd call bullshit. Yeah, well, it, they didn't call it hit training, I don't think. I think they might have called You know what? There's a. What, he, I mean, we should credit the coach who did it, right? So it's Coach Peter Coe is supposedly the first person to like really make it popular, but it wasn't popular then. It wasn't when we, when no, we, no, there's no, no work. When I was in high school in and we were lifting weights, like I, I never even heard the, the term hit until the 2000s. You know, the closest yeah. thing I remember that was old. And I only remember this because the name was so funny as a kid. I thought it was hilarious. Fartlek. You ever, you ever, you know oh, what a fart lick, yeah. fart licking is? Oh, you, yeah. it's like that. You run and then you walk. Wait, wait, go back, go back, Doug. You, you, it says Arthur Jones. You should bring that back. Go, go up right there, right there. Oh, see, Arthur Jones. No, his, his was uh, high intensity training, not high intensity interval training. Oh, so Arthur Jones is the one that pioneered the not whole, a like, one set to failure. The famous uh, Casey Viator study, the Denver, oh, okay. the Denver yeah, project. Yeah. Uh, I was Mike, say, Mike he wasn't known my, for hit. No, he was not known uh, for hit, but. This came out, and and there was a study that showed that oh, it, it burns as many calories, but you got to do less time. It spares muscle. Uh -huh. uh, there was another study that showed it's got some positive hormone effects. Now, there's some truth to this, and then there's also a little bit of uh, false expectations. Now, the the truth in it is that yes, it in a head to head comparison, so long as it's appropriate and all things are equal. It is more muscle sparing because it's the resistance training form of cardio. So l let me explain, right? Yeah, that's like saying like a, a, a hammer is incredible when hitting a nail. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know Anything else, it's not very useful. Well, you know what it it's is? It's not very okay. good for screws. You know what it reminds no. me of? It's like when people, you ever talk to like the average person who doesn't know much about exercise and you say, hey, you should try resistance training. It's really effective. And they'll say, oh, I use dumbbells and barbells. And you're like, oh yeah, how do you use them? <clears throat> I do the body pump class in my, you know, my gym, or I do this large circuit. And and then you have to explain to them, well, you're, you're doing cardio with weights, even though you're using resistance, you're actually making it more like cardio. Yeah. Hit training, although it is a form of cardiovascular training is more like resistance training than traditional cardiovascular training because of the short durations of maximal intensity. And it's more related to like sprinting. So you're going to get more of that muscle sparing effect than you would if you did you know, steady state, kind of long dura duration, low intensity uh, type of cardio. But the problem now is what typically happens in the fitness space is a study or two will come out. And so long as it feeds the the popular narrative, which is the harder, the better. Uh, oh, cool. We can have short time. Oh, I can beat the crap out of my clients. Then it's going to become popular. And this is just yeah. what tends to happen. And it got abused and it got applied poorly. And I'll, t I'll be honest with you. Let me ask you guys a question. How often do you see HIT training being applied appropriately or properly <laughs> Never. in the gym? I never. Don't think it, yeah. I, don't, I can't think of an example other than maybe somebody I was training. Never. Almost it's, never. It's used the way you just, you just ex explained, which is most people are just doing cardio with weights. Yeah. Uh, most people are attracted to the sweat, the burn, the high intensity aspect of HIT. And so the the protocol, the prerequisites get kind of thrown out the door and it's just, can I make this client sweat and burn uh, and feel like they got an incredible workout? And what really that ends up mirroring more like running on a treadmill and stairmaster. Yes, you're using dumbbells or barbells to do it, but it actually looks more like what's going on inside your body looks more like what what happens when you get on yeah, a treadmill if than you apply, when you actually lift weights. Totally, because if you apply HIT training properly um, and you do it right in a short period of time, because your body will adapt to it after a certain period of time, but if you do it right, it's extremely effective. Yeah. But it also has to be appropriate for the person. Uh, there are people that HIT training, I would never apply mm -hmm. HIT training to a lot of people. Like if I trained somebody who is deconditioned, uh, hasn't worked out in a while, maybe doesn't have good stability, or maybe they're overstressed. You get that type A individual that's just super high stress. HIIT training is terrible. It's a super high intense way of getting their body to crash or injure themselves. Yeah. Unfortunately, the people I just labeled are the ones that often gravitate towards HIIT training. So it's, yeah. you, you, you has, it has to be for the right person. You have to be able to move well, not be in a super high stress lifestyle because HIT is extremely high stress on the body. It's a form of exercise that's very high stress. And if you if you're not any of those two things and you do it right and there's more that goes into it, then it can be, you know, very effective. Yeah, I mean that really I guess is what why usually it sounds like we're against HIT or at least me personally. It's just because I've seen so many examples of people out there that can't even maintain proper posture. Uh, just through like a, a strength exercise where you're just supposed to be controlled. You're supposed to have control over yeah. your body uh, and without restriction in the joint, without pain in the joint, 
um, and be able to, you know, apply these movements uh, without with with ease, and, and then to to then jump them into something that's like really explosive and fast paced. Uh, it, it's just to me, like, why are you doing that? I don't think you come off like we, like you don't like it or hate it or that you're against it. I think that it's, I think you're on, you're on point. I think that it's of all the modalities of training out there, it's one of the most abused. Clearly, 100%. It's just that. It, it's not that you're anti it or there's not tremendous yep. value in it or it's not applicable to certain clients. It's just that when you look at like all the different ways of training, like it, a lot of people don't abuse yoga. <laughs> I'm saying it's not a, it's not a popularly abused. Yeah. This is an abused way of training because, mm -hmm. because of the things that Sal was alluding to with the, you know, burn and the intensity it feeds into all that. Yeah. And then, and the, the, the mainstream narrative, it, it feeds into that. Therefore it's happens to be one of the most abused. Yeah. And here's one of the other reasons yeah. why it's abused or used improperly is that people oftentimes, this is true for all forms of exercise. People judge the effectiveness by how hard it feels or how much they suffer. Uh, through the workout. And because HIT training literally has intensity in the name, now crappy coaches and trainers and popular fitness media companies can sell programs that just do that. Mm -hmm. And so then people do it and they're like, oh my God, I could barely finish and I'm breathing hard and I'm sweating. This is a great workout when in fact it's not. Here's one of the biggest, number one biggest mistakes I see with HIT training. When I examine HIT workouts, which if you look at all the most popular workouts that are sold to the like workout programs that are sold to the average person, hit has hit style workouts have to be near the top, right? That style of training has got to be up near the top. So when I look at all of them, I almost never see great workout programming. It's almost like, and I this is probably what happens is they throw together difficult exercises together, and they say, you know, it would be really hard after doing jump squats burpees. Oh, you know what we could do next? Let's throw in some, you know, some windmills or let's throw in some, you know, whatever to make it really hard. And there's almost no focus on programming. It's almost like the exercises are interchangeable. It doesn't matter so long as you do them in a row. Well, I, I, <clears throat> I clearly re remember uh, doing that myself. I remember sitting down and writing uh, hit workouts for clients back in 0102. And what decided what what exercise I'd put there was I was always thinking what was going to elevate their heart rate up the most right yeah. here. What mm -hmm. could I do? So let's say I, I'm I'm trying to attack the full body. Like this is exactly the thought process of my programming back then. This is why I wasn't a great trainer. But I also know that every almost all trainers did it this way. It's like okay, today's a full body routine. I got to train this client, so I want I got to hit buys, try shoulders, some mm -hmm. of that. Well, I know that <clears throat> when my client does. Uh, a bicep curl, a tricep push down, and a lateral raise, their heart rate doesn't get up there very high no. because it's a very, very small muscles that we're hitting. So what I want to do is I want to do a squat first, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do this. And then when I go to the next series of exercises, yep. I'm going to pick another compound lift first and then do the smaller muscles because I'm going to elevate the heart rate to keep it up while I do all these other ones. So I get the most calorie burn. That mm -hmm. was the thought process when when writing a hit program back then. And yes. I still think it is today. So when you see, and that's what I see when I, I walk in a gym and I see trainers training clients, is I always see a compound or plyometric exercise paired with the, the little auxiliary movements. And you know what they're doing. They're using those compound lifts or plyometric exercises to elevate the heart rate mm -hmm. so that they're burning more calories when they do the simple Yeah, it's always movements. jump squats, jump lunges, squat press, burpees, you know, all just kind of thrown together. Sometimes mm -hmm. jumping jacks. Mountain and, climbers. Yeah, well, yeah, they'll throw mountain climbers in there because the trainer's like, what else can I do? I ran out of exercises. This will make them really tired. I like the term programming when we talk about uh, designing a good workout because we can take that word and as an analogy, we can look at programming for like uh, technology or computers, right? If if we break it down, and I'm not a, a programmer with computers, but I, I, I can safely say that a lot of programming is basically ones and zeros, right? So it's ones and zeros. But those numbers aren't interchangeable. I can't just throw a bunch of ones and zeros out on a computer screen and then expect it to make a program. There has to be an order and there's a way you put them together that creates the the beauty of whatever program you're trying to create. Well, now take that understanding and apply it to exercise. Rather than ones and zeros, what good trainers and coaches have to work with are exercises, tempo, rep ranges, 
um, exercise order, what we start with, what we finish with, what follows each exercise. And I'm sure, by the way, a, uh, an engineer would tell you that's what coding is like, Absolutely. too. That there's all these different variables. You're saying ones and zeros because we know nothing about it. <laughs> 100%. The, yeah. I guarantee an engineer would say there's all kinds of variables just like that 100%. And good programming results in the desired result. Results, it, it ends up with the result you're looking for. Fat loss, muscle gain, balance, symmetry, aesthetics, right? If I just throw a bunch of stuff onto a piece of paper and say, here's your workout, and there's no emphasis on good programming, what you're going to get at most, at most, is you'll move and you'll sweat. Yeah, you'll okay? get tired. Here's what you'll get at worst. Injury, uh, overstress your body, muscle loss. You're going to feel like crap, hormone dysfunction, right? Which often happens when people just do a lot of these workouts because the programming sucks. So number one with high-intensity interval training the programming matters as much as it does with any other type of workout. So Arguably more. You're right because there's there because the intensity and how you're working so quickly that a small like the wrong programming, the wrong exercise at the wrong time is going to greatly in increase risk of injury or reduce the chance of of really good results. So programming makes a huge difference and most hit programs are not written with that intent whatsoever. They're just written with exercises uh, that are hard. This is why, for example, when we created uh, our HIP program, we spent a lot of time. We, we actually sat down and spent a lot of time figuring out the order and the reps and how we're going to do these particular exercises because well, we know that that's one of the most important features especially, of a good workout. Yeah, because we're, we're doing these with speed now and we're cutting our rest time. And so what does that transition look like going into another exercise? Like as a coach, you got to make sure you're setting your client up for uh, success. So there's not a whole lot of uh, things they got to battle in terms of like being able to control their body, be able to be composed uh, and not fatigue uh, them too early, right? In, in the workout and, and something that they can kind of string out. So all of those little factors matter when you're, when you're stacking these exercises together. Well, for the, the audience that actually cares about this stuff, it was the largest launch and the, the biggest um program launch we'd ever did in, in mind pumps history. And we, so. by the way, it was, we didn't come out with that program until we wrote lots of other yeah. prerequisite programs. And I remember that. I remember our marketing that. team was so mad at us for not coming out with it first, but we're like, we can't responsibly do this until we have these other things that people it's can set themselves up. Also the only program of all programs that we have that has a warning on it because we know that it's abused so frequently by people and that we don't encourage people to stay in that. Uh, and of all the programming that we have, it, it's the one that I would not recommend that people run in a loop. You could get away with running MAPS Anabolic all year long, the mm -hmm. way it's phased, it's set up. And it doesn't mean that you couldn't technically do HIT, but we don't recommend it because that's what most people do. No, I think the best way to apply HIT training, if you want maximum results, is to use it as a way to is interject it into other workout yeah. programming. Mm -hmm. So two to or three months- Interrupt all the other MAPS programs. Yeah, so like you'll follow MAPS Anabolic and then you'll do MAPS Hit. And then you'll go and do maybe MAPS Performance and then you could do MAPS Hit again. Um, and in that short period of time, it's very effective at burning body fat, improving stamina, yeah. improving strength, endurance, and that kind of stuff. Go ahead. Well, uh, I was going to say, and this kind of leads into the next point, but like back on the, the programming side of it, it may look simple on paper. It may, and this is something like as far as a critique, if it gets any critiques, uh, the way that we program this is because we intentionally made sure uh, that the flow was right. That uh, as you're performing these exercises, you're still able to do them with correct form and composure. And to do that, you're not going to want to throw the kitchen sink at there just to wear you out, which is what you see on TV, which is what you see in magazines and you see all these like crazy ass workouts that have like all the coolest, you know, craziest looking yeah. exercise and moves that are worthless. Yes. Uh, so, you know, just to bring it back down, distill it down to what matters and to perform it and execute it, uh, you know, with perfect form is something that well, is a big deal. For some reason, of all the forms of exercise, uh, hit training somehow gets a pass for perfect form. Now, bad trainers and bad coaches and people who don't know will have bad form when they do almost anything because they're just after the burn and the the sweat. But even I've even seen decent trainers take form and throw out the window when it comes to HIT training because the goal they think with HIT training is the intensity aspect of it. So it's almost like, well, your form can be a lot looser with this exercise because we're doing HIT or you don't have to be perfect. 
That is so wrong. Well, it's because they have the they have the wrong people doing it. That's why you know, you see it's most it's most popular used with people that are overweight and relatively new to the gym as this quick way to get them to shred body fat mm -hmm. and hopefully hang on to some muscle or build a little bit of muscle. So the, the person that is doing this is not the right clientele that you see, at least most. I mean, you see some, yeah. some people that are advanced and athletes that are doing it, which is fine. They're probably a better, uh, a better avatar for that. But I think it, why you see that is because you have these new people. You have coaches and trainers that want to show this client quick results because they have a lot of weight to shed. They know if they keep them moving and burning a ton of calories forget that their burpees look ugly and their their jump boxes look like their knees are going to explode i know they're burning and they're burning a ton of calories and they're going to lose some weight from this so they're they're applying it to what i think is yeah. the wrong population of people yeah i think just to illustrate this if you imagine every exercise has let's say two meters on every exercise and one meter is how effective you can make that exercise. And then there's another meter that says how dangerous or how high the potential of risk is or that you can make this particular exercise. The better your form is, the higher the potential of the effectiveness of the exercise and the lower the potential of risk of injury for that exercise. The worse your form is, the less results you get from it and the higher risk of injury. This is true for any type of workout program, especially for HIIT training because HIIT training has a lot of fatigue involved. So perfect form is absolutely crucial. Now with HIIT training, oftentimes what people will do, and this is part of HIIT training, is you'll do an exercise until maybe you can't perform the exercise anymore. But people misunderstand that as, I do this until I can't move anymore. No, you do it until your perfect form is no longer perfect. That means you're done. Now we move on to the next movement. Because the second your form isn't perfect, we're losing effectiveness. We're actually wasting time with what we're doing. And we're only increasing risk of injury. And what are you here for, right? You're here to get maximum results and not hurt yourself. And the, and the way to do that is for perfect form. So HIIT training, you have to have a very strong emphasis on form. And you almost never see that with any kind of fatigue-based program. It's almost like it gets a pass because it's hit training. Yeah, it's just kind of funny if you just think about like continually practicing bad behavior. What you know? What are you going to replicate after that, right? So it's it's just about making sure that what you're doing is quality. So that way, when you actually you know go to use this or like you know, you, you know apply this to, to other workouts, like you still maintain that good behavior, that good form. Yeah. Well, well, a good squat is, for example, done properly is extremely safe. It strengthens the lower body. It works the quadriceps, the hamstrings, the glutes. It works the core and the stabilizers. You get some upper thoracic stability. It's a phenomenal exercise, okay? A squat done poorly trains all those muscles I just explained, not very well. And now you've dramatically increased your risk of, of pain and injury in your knees, in your low back, in your hips, in your ankles, which is why HIIT training has a higher rate of injury than other forms of exercise. Again, because people don't realize that perfect form is crucial for all forms of, of resistance training, but especially for hit tile style well, training. I think part of what leads to that is not only do I think the wrong people are doing it, but also the next point uh, is a major reason for this. And that is the lack of rest periods. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So not only do I see the wrong people doing it, but then I see coaches and trainers teaching it again, like cardio where there's like either no rest periods or very minimal rest periods for the, the client to fully recover so then they can go perform that perfect form. Right. When you are e exhausted and then you're trying to perform a complex movement like a squat, squats are hard with rest. Yeah. <laughs> you got perfect rest You got and you, and you start off yeah, on you a squat. Yeah, you rest for four minutes and it's still hard. Yeah, a squat is still a, a very technical exercise. Same thing, same thing with like a jump box or some of these movements that you see people using in, in these circuits. And that's another reason why I think this is uh, why you see it, it, it uh, poorly programmed and failed is the lack yeah. of the rest The periods. problem is with HIIT training, uh, we identify it as no rest. And the truth is you should still have rest. It's not like rest periods with traditional resistance training. So traditional resistance training, you're probably on average resting 90 seconds, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, depending on what phase or you're in your training. With HIIT training, it is true that you rest less, but you still need to rest long enough to be able to perform the next exercise with perfect form. Yeah. So you don't need to be fully rested. It is more cardio than other forms of resistance training 
but you still need to have enough rest to get your composure yeah. so that you can perform the next exercise with perfect form. That's one of the reasons why the form is so crappy with hit training. And that's why, too, it's on an individual basis. Yes. Uh, not everybody is going to have the same type of conditioning like coming into it. And so you have to pay attention to those things yourself uh, to know when your form starts to degrade, when I can't perform this exercise correctly, and then like how long it takes for me to regain my composure so I know, okay, now this exercise, I can do this with good form. Well, isn't this also one of the, the number one reasons why it is effective is the heart rate variability. Is the God, is, so glad you said that. Is mm -hmm. the it's not just keeping it up the whole yeah, time. Yeah, if, if you're just keeping it up all the time, sure, you may be, quote unquote, burning more calories. So but it's an interval. What yeah. makes HIT training so beneficial is the, the recovery process. Yes. It's the heart rate coming back down towards the resting heart rate and then the climb again and the coming back down. If you don't have the, the peaks and valleys like that, you lose a lot of the benefits from it. Then it is, if it's just peaked all the time, mm -hmm. then it's just cardio. That's it all is. you're doing. You, you want the real benefits of HIT. One of the most valuable things that you can do is allow the heart rate to come all the way back down, which is this is where you have to modify a person. I could have one person where all they need to rest is 30 seconds to a minute because their 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 cardio it's endurance is there. Yeah, and they can go right back at it. Then I have another person I might have to rest three minutes for their heart rate to drop back down for me to go back at it again. So you got to be able to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, in, fa in, in fact, when you look at the most basic forms of HIT that are very simple, uh, performed on like an Airdyne or a treadmill – what they tell you to do is to train at maximal heart rate and then wait till your heart rate comes down, however long that takes before you go into another interval. A lot of people don't consider that. And to them, it's like, I do this sprint and then I cruise for 20 seconds and I got to sprint again, regardless of right, where the heart my heart is. rate, which does completely defeat the purpose. So good hit training would offer you some type of a complex uh, where you're doing multiple exercises. And then you should probably rest long enough to let the heart rate come down, compose yourself before you do it again. Not what a lot of people do, which is they go, go, go until they can't move anymore. And, you know, back to Adam's point, like if I do a really hard set of squats where I rack the bar and I'm like, I can't do another rep with good form. You can tell me to do a set of dumbbell curls and it'll look crappy right afterwards. I'm so exhausted. A simple exercise like dumbbell curls is going to look really bad. I'm not, I'm going to have bad form. So I also in between exercises, have to give myself at least enough rest to be able to compose myself, not as long as, as I would with a traditional resistance training workout, but enough to where, okay, I can do some good quality reps. Otherwise, this is the truth. If you don't follow those things that I, I just said, the exercises don't matter. It really, no joke. You may as well jump jump in place. You, I swear to God, you take, I used to tell my trainers this, that would work for me. I would, when I, after they do a training session, then I would do a, a like a training session for the trainers because I don't want to, you know, isolate a specific trainer. But I would say to them, if your clients are looking like this, you're not giving them enough rest to compose themselves. I don't know why you guys are putting different exercises together. Yeah, you may as well just do this. You, yeah, you, you might as well ha just have them jump in place <laughs> yeah, and yeah. run in circles. Save your money. Totally. Because it's, it doesn't matter. And this is to people who are thinking about hiring coaches. You don't need, if that's what you want to do, you don't need to hire anybody. Literally move yeah. uh, for 30 minutes Chinese. real hard. And it's the that's same. It. It's the same thing. So the form is crucial. And the rest is a tool that's used to ensure uh, perfect form, which brings me to the next thing. This is a super big pet peeve of mine. For some reason, one of the most popular forms of exercise in HIT training is plyometrics. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the irony of all that. Of all forms of exercise, <laughs> plyometrics has to be the most specific in terms of how it needs to be applied. Plyometrics literally are, the reason why they exist at all is to improve explosive ability. Now, to, to improve explosive ability or to improve strength ability or endurance ability, you have to train it. So I can't get more explosive with plyometrics if I'm not training it explosively. Yeah. It's impossible to train plyometrics explosively when I'm just doing it in a fatigue circuit. So now I'm just jumping up and down. There's zero explosiveness going on. All I'm doing is jumping you know, in place yeah. until well, I can't move anymore. Kind of speaks a little to the biomechanics of it, but um, really, like what you're trying to do is generate as much force as possible at that one instance. Yes. And to be able to do that, you can't have any inkling of fatigue. And so, uh, to to be able to now uh, take my body through uh, this entire process where I need this triple extension, I need all these joints to communicate with each other at once and to perform this explosively. 
you know, I need to make sure I'm, I'm under the utmost composure and focus. It takes a lot of focus. So um, to, to be able to apply plyometrics properly for one, uh, you know, you need a lot of focus and concentration and you need to have uh, your wits about you. You need to be not in any state of, of fatigue. And then also back to the original point of the prerequisites. So uh, to be able to apply these uh, <laughs> exercises, we got to make sure our joints are healthy enough to handle that kind of stress. Again, the, 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 the uh, programming on this, right? The reason why people or trainers do this is is only because it's hard. It's just like I was saying earlier about the mm -hmm. squatting and the barbell complexes. Mm -hmm. The when you would write those, when I would write those, uh, when I was twenty years old on these, I would go, okay, oh man, jump boxes. Those are really fucking hard, you know. So I'll put that first, <laughs> and then I'll do this exercise. And it was literally the whole reason why I'm putting in there is not because I'm going to try and help this person jump better or improve their form or work their quads so much. It was that I know this is going to elevate the shit out of their heart rate. Mm -hmm. And then I would go to these other exercises and it's, it couldn't be more uh, programmed, uh, more awful than that because of how, how risky plyometrics I are. I did the same thing and that's exactly it. It's like, I'm going to pick a hard exercise just to make you tired. I can do that with much safer. Like if that's your goal, if your goal is just to get tired, don't pick plyometrics because what you're doing is you're picking exercises now that have a high risk of injury when you're really tired. If you want to train explosive ability, fast twitch muscle fibers, right? These are the muscle fibers that have the greatest potential for, for visible change. These are the ones that grow and sculpt. Then you have to do it explosively. You can't do it super fatigued. Otherwise, it's just, again, it's endurance training, in which case don't do plyometrics. And then back to Justin's point, if you can't squat with perfect form and stability, then you have no business squat jumping. Like all you're doing is adding right. an element of explosiveness to something that you can't do. That's when you're, when you're, it's not being explosive. Right. But if you can do it perfectly and you do everything right and it's programmed properly, plyometrics have tremendous benefits. They can really change the body and they have so much carryover to your other exercises. I mean, power lifters. Okay. If you look at power lifting for people who don't know, it's a, it's a sport where people compete in the bench press, the deadlift, and the squat. And when you watch powerlifting competitions, they don't look explosive. I mean, they're lifting maximal weight. They're grinding the weight up. It might take them three seconds to get the weight up, and it's a very controlled like strength movement. Yet years ago, powerlifters realized that if they did some explosive training in their training, which meant they used lighter weight and they moved the weight much faster— they got great strength gains as well. Um, I think at some point, people who are training just for muscular hypertrophy, just for size, will really start to figure this out. In fact, you see sometimes people in pl uh, you know putting plyometrics in their training just to get more development. Mm -hmm. So it's a very effective tool, but it's a tool that needs to be used properly. And most HIIT training programs throw plyometrics in just to get you tired. Yeah. And they're not being used properly at and all. And it's at the peak, right? And so it's a kind of that point, which was our next point about phasing, uh, you know, your programming and making sure that uh, it's stacked in such a way uh, that you're kind of leading up to something like a plyometric type of a workout, which, you know, we're, we're sort of prepping the body. So, you know, considering that we start out with lifting weights and doing traditional type of weightlifts, now we cut the rest time in between and we get that benefit from it. And then we move on to multiplanar type movement and, you know, using dumbbells and then we get into, you know, plyometric training. There's a reason, a rhyme and a reason why we set you up in that direction. Yeah. I don't think when I, when I looked at all the hip programs that were out there before we did ours, there was no uh, attention paid to this, right? With at the, all. Yeah. With the phasing, it was the only, most, most of them were circuit based was the same thing that you were running over and over, or at best you would just interchange exercises. Yes. Oh, so instead of doing this, the squat right here, I'm going to put the deadlift right here. Like that was the, the, com that's all they were doing to change the routine up instead of actually methodically thinking about what adaptation are we focusing on right now, running that for a couple of weeks and then phasing out of that into something else. You just didn't see that. No theme. Yeah. There's no theme to the phases. Phases need to have a theme, strength, power, you know, multiplanar movement, because when you're training specifically for a theme or an adaptation, the body does a very damn good job of moving in that direction. If there's no theme, what ends up happening is you get some great results for two or three weeks. Your body adapts. Look, we've all experienced this. You've done a routine. You, you, you Let's say you try a new workout. You saw it in a magazine or online and you're like, oh my God, it's the best workout I've ever done. Mm -hmm. In the last you know, 60 days, my bench press went up 15 pounds. My squat went up 30 pounds. 
this is amazing. You're telling your friends, this is the greatest workout uh, of all time. I can't, this is going to get me where I want to go. And then all of a sudden, it just stops working. All of a sudden, you know, four weeks later or whatever, six weeks later, you're working out. You're like, what happened, man? I hit a hard plateau. And then you just, you know, stubbornly stick to it, right? I've done this so many times, right? I'm just because I remember how great it was a few weeks ago. Not only is your body plateau, then it starts to go backwards. What the hell is yeah. going on? Your body got used to it. It didn't work anymore. And you have to change the phase to get the body to continue to progress. And this is true for HIIT training as well. In fact, for HIIT training, phases should be shorter than they are for traditional resistance training. You know, if I'm doing like a bodybuilding style, you know, workout, the phases are three to five weeks. Mm -hmm. When we're doing HIIT training, which a total HIIT program is shorter than a total traditional resistance training program because the adaptations happen so fast, my phases are like two weeks long. Mm -hmm. They're not any longer than that usually. I'm not doing five-week phases of the same stuff. Yeah, and for some reason in the space, you've seen a lot of programs out there that really harp on the muscle confusion and to really confuse the body constantly by throwing everything <laughs> at you at once, right? And I had argued muscle focus is what you need to be doing. And that's where you start phasing these out so your body can actually get good at something for you know that two to three week. Even if we, we make it a brief window, that's our focus. That's what we're trying to adapt to instead of just take on uh, all the stress and just hope for the best. Yeah. If when you, the, go ahead. If you were to explain Sorry. to somebody the reason behind why we phase, uh, you know, hit training sh so short in comparison to traditional training, would it be mainly because of it's so intense? Is that why? I mean, I, I mean, I think you could, uh, I would say the same thing. I would say that about plyometrics also like plyometrics or hit training. If you have those, that type of training in your routine, I, I don't think I would ever take a client in it much longer than two to three weeks because of how intense it is. That's the main reason yeah, why. It depends on the individual, right? With athletes, mm -hmm. you're going to be phasing. Athletes could probably go a little Yeah, longer. playing. But 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 see, with athletes, it's not just plyos. There's lots of other stuff that's getting phased. Well, there's, with athletes too, It's the desired outcome is not what 99% of the clients exactly. that are hiring. Exactly. I mean, 99% of clients that hire a, a coach or a trainer are looking for fat loss, muscle building, or overall health. Mm -hmm. Athletes are mainly looking for performance and it's and, very specific type yeah, of performance right and so i don't really care that they're they're you know four or five weeks into doing their hit training they're losing the, the the max benefits of losing body fat or building muscle from it because they don't really care about their all performance based mm -hmm. and so so long as their performance is improving i would i could extend that but for the rest of the population yeah. as soon as you start to lose those muscle building effects or fat burning effects you want to be out of well that. in 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 general HIIT training does something really well, is it burns, it can, if done properly, I want to, I always got to say that, because I know when I say what I'm about to say, everybody freaks out, and then they, this is what I'm going to do all the time. If applied properly, there is no form of training in the context of a good diet and good lifestyle and all that stuff, there is no form of training that will burn body fat faster in a shorter period of time. That being said, it also doesn't work very long, mm -hmm. okay? So, if I follow a traditional resistance training type program, I mean, let's use our flagship workout program, MAPS Anabolic, very traditional resistance training, overall strength. That's a three-month workout program. It lasts for three months, right? HIIT training, you're going to get really fast fat, fat loss results. But even if you phase it right, even if you do everything right, you'll see after a relatively short period of time, it's just not as effective and it's time to go back to more traditional resistance training. So although you get fast results from it, you also hit the plateau wall much faster if you don't switch out and move to something different, which is why the, the phases are shorter. So if I'm doing a six-week program, then yeah, I'm going to do two-week phases, three of them or something like that, right? Versus yeah. a 12-week program where I can do you know, three, four week, you know, type phases or four, three week phases. Now I got to bring up something that I have never seen in another hit program. And that is a mobility focus. Yeah. Day. It's my favorite part about what we did. Right. I mean, something that actually helps to restore the joints because we are adding so much stress. Like the, it really does, you know, take a toll on, on the joints specifically uh, when we move explosively. And, uh, you know, that kind of impact, we need to make sure that we maintain the health and, and integrity of. And so these mobility sessions, uh, you know, I, I, I thought it was imperative that at least we have one day in the recovery day, the active recovery day of going through uh, and, and addressing all of these joints to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're reinforcing them. Going yeah. Well, forward. when you look at uh, even good hit training, so everything's done right, it's written properly, it's programmed properly. There's still weaknesses in all forms of training, which is why ideally over a course of a year, two years, you, you change your focuses and you do different styles of training 
because every form of training, even if it's perfect, has got some weaknesses. And one of the weaknesses of HIT are, one of them is the strength, the intensity aspect of it, uh, but that can become a weakness because of the intensity, the recovery becomes an issue um, and your body does recover faster and better actively than it does when you're doing nothing. In other words, uh, unless you're severely overtrained, like you're, you got rhabdo and you got to go to the hospital or something like that, unless you're severely overtrained, moving properly and lightly will get your body to heal and recover and adapt better than just sitting on the couch like you're just trying to recover. I remember doing that as a kid. I'd work out yeah. and then I wouldn't move at all because I think, oh, this My is going to My muscles are growing. Yeah, and that's not how it works. You're, you're better off moving a little bit. So that's one, right? The second weakness of HIT uh, is the fact that because it's higher intensity, because rest periods are shorter, because uh, you know, you're pushing yourself uh, through this workout, that your joints can pay the price, your form can pay the price. And so if you don't place a special focus on mobility, then you're, the, the chances of hitting that wall of injury or pain, they, it starts to creep up on you. And what you don't want to do, and this is what sucks, is you're doing a HIT program, even if it's written properly, and you're applying it properly, and then you're three weeks into it, and you're like, oh my God, this is awesome, but I can't, my low back is bothering me, and I can't do the workout anymore. What do I do now? Or my knees are hurting a little bit, or my shoulders are bothering me. Now you got to stop this workout that you're seeing great results from, and mainly because you didn't address mobility from the gates, right out the gates, right? So mobility needs to be a focus as part of your HIIT training to ensure that that doesn't happen and to really maximize the results you're going to get throughout the entire HIIT workout. Well, shameless plug, but one of my favorite things about this program was the flow sessions. And I've actually had people mm -hmm. buy the program just for that. Oh, you can use so the even, flow sessions with any. So even if you're yeah. not, you know, oh, I don't want to do hit training. It's not for me, or it doesn't seem like something that I would want to uh, add into my routine. I've actually prescribed some of my clients and friends to buy hit just so they could specifically use the flow sessions mm -hmm. because we don't have a single program that has that like that. Yeah. And I think they're unique and I think they're fun. And I think that you can mm -hmm. blend those into any of the routine. So let's say you're following a MAPS anabolic. You love it. You got great results from it. Maybe you're getting ready to run it a second time, but you want to add some sort of a mobility component in it. Having the hit flow sessions built in on trigger days is a great way to add mobility to a strength focus. Program. Yeah. I remember in, you know, going through and writing it, there were different things that we had to address that we didn't necessarily have to address with other workouts. Another thing that we had to look at was how can we make this workout appropriate for beginners, intermediate people, and advanced people? And we were able to do that. And so when you follow a good HIT program, you have to figure that out for yourself and be honest with yourself and say, I'm going to, and, and I, this is what I always recommend to people. Unless this is your style of training and you're really fit, everybody should start with beginner because you still have two, two levels that you can move up through. But this ensures that you're training yourself appropriately. And remember this, and we've talked about this many times on the show, there, it's like a bell curve when it comes to results with your body. So on one end is no results because you're doing nothing. On the other end is no results because you're doing too much, too much intensity, too much volume, too much frequency, inappropriate levels of you know, of load or whatever. So on the two ends, there's no results. You're not getting any results. And then somewhere in the middle, you see this peak of maximum results. And this is different from person to person, but what that middle represents, that bell curve middle represents the right dose for you. And the right dose gives you the best results. And this is why it's so important when you follow any kind of a workout, especially a HIIT style workout, that it, you follow it and it's appropriate for your body because when you hit that magic appropriate level, and I say magic because that's what it feels like, when you hit the right appropriate amount of intensity and speed and frequency and volume and exercises for your body, you don't feel like you're fighting your body to progress. It actually starts to progress for you. And it's a great feeling. This is the only program too that we actually had levels in, right? So that's, we, that's, yep. Yeah. So this is the only program where we actually built in, like depending on your um, experience level, where you should start off uh, with the routine. But uh, by far, uh, one of the most popular programs uh, that we ever wrote. But again, only program that we've ever put a warning on because, again, people get so addicted to the results because they do come on fast. And so knowing how to intermittently use it with other routines, I think, is extremely powerful. So here's a summary, right? So if you're doing a HIIT workout for yourself, 
Make sure the programming makes sense. So don't just throw a bunch of exercises together, but they need to flow together with some logic, training your bro- your body appropriately. Number two, your form has got to be perfect. So when you're following a HIIT workout, just like any workout, make sure your form is really good. Still use rest to ensure proper form. So if you're going from exercise to exercise and you're like, I cannot maintain perfect form no matter what, rest long enough to ensure that that happens because form is, is number one. Uh, don't do plyometrics unless they're being applied properly. So plyometrics are need, need to be done explosively and you need to be able to apply them explosively. So if it's done with no rest and you're repeating other exercises with it and you're just going in a circuit, then don't do plyometrics, do other safer exercises because you're wasting your time. Phase your workouts. And with HIIT training, you're looking at probably two-week phases. So there's themes, right? Barbell theme, multiplanar theme, plyo theme. You know, train in two-week phases or so. Uh, that'll get your body to progress more consistently. You'll hit less plateaus as a result. And then the last thing is put some kind of a mobility focus. So let's say you're doing a hit style workout three days a week. In, in, in my opinion, at least two days a week, you should go to the gym and just focus on mobility so that again, you can maximize, maximize results and minimize the risk of injury. Also, if you just want to follow a workout that's written out for you, um, then you can try our program, Maps Hit. And I do believe that it's 50% off this month. I need Doug, give me the, is, is that true? The Maps Hit is 50% off, right? That's the offer this month. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So if you just want to follow a program right now, we have exercise demos in there and the whole thing. You can go to mapsfitnessproducts.com, click on Maps Hit, and then use the code December, December 50. So that's December and then the number 50 with no space. Also, if you want more free information from us, Go to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. And then finally, you can follow us all on Instagram. Justin can be found at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal. And Adam is at mindpumpadam. 